Rumpelstiltskin by the Brothers Grimm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Johnson, a.k.a. Joe Kooning. Email at joekooning at gmail.com. Rumpelstiltskin by the Brothers Grimm. There once was a poor miller who had a beautiful daughter, and one day, having to go speak with the king, he said, in order to make himself appear of consequence, that he had a daughter who could spin straw into gold. The king was very fond of gold, and thought to himself, That is an art that would please me very well. And so he said to the miller, If your daughter is so clever, bring her to the castle in the morning, and I will put her to the proof. As soon as she arrived, the king led her into a chamber which was full of straw, and giving her a wheel and a reel, he said, Now set yourself to work, and if you have not spun this straw into gold by an early hour tomorrow, you must die. With these words he shut the room door, and left the maiden alone. There she sat for a long time, thinking how to save her life, for she understood nothing of the art whereby straw might be spun into gold and her perplexity increased more and more, till at last she began to weep. All at once the door opened, and in stepped a little man who said, Good evening, fair maiden. Why do you weep so sore? Ah, oh, she replied, I must spin this straw into gold, and I am sure I do not know how. The little man asked, Will you give me something if I spin it for you? My necklace, said the maiden. The dwarf took it placed himself in front of the wheel, and whirr, 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 three times around, and the bobbin was full. Then he set up another, and whirr, 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 thrice, round again, and the second bobbin was full. And he went all night long, until all the straw was spun, and the bobbins were full of gold. At sunrise the king came, very much astonished to see the gold, the sight of which gladdened him, but he did not make his heart less covetous. He caused the maiden to be led into another room, still larger, full of straw. Then he bade her spin it into gold during the night if she valued her life. The maiden was again quite at loss what to do. But while she cried, the door opened suddenly as before, and the dwarf appeared and asked her what she would give him in return for his assistance. The ring of my finger, she replied. The little man took the ring and began to spin at once, and by morning all the straw had changed to glistening gold. The king was rejoiced above the measure at the sight of this, but he still was not satisfied. But, leading the maiden into another still larger room, full of straw as the others, he said, This you will spin during the night, but if you accomplish it, you shall be my bride. For, thought he to himself, a richer wife thou canst not have in all the world. When the maiden was left alone, the dwarf again appeared and asked for the third time, what will you give me to do this for you? I have nothing left that I can give you, replied the maiden. Then promise me your firstborn child if you become queen, said he. The miller's daughter thought, Who can tell if that will ever happen? And ignorant how else to help herself out of her trouble, she promised the dwarf what he desired, and he immediately set about and finished the spinning. The morning came and the king found all he had wished for done. He celebrated his wedding, and the miller's daughter became the queen. The gay times she had at the king's court caused her to forget that she had made a very foolish promise. About a year after the marriage, when she had ceased to think about the little dwarf, she brought a fine child into the world, and suddenly, soon after its birth, the very man appeared and demanded what she had promised. The frightened queen offered him all the riches of the kingdom if he would leave her her child, but the dwarf answered, No, something human is dearer to me than all the wealth in the world. The queen began to weep and groan so much that the dwarf pitied her, and said, I will leave you three days to consider. If you in that time discover my name, you shall keep your child. All night long the queen racked her brains for all the names she could think of, and sent a message through the country to collect far and wide any new names. The following morning came the dwarf, and she began with Casper, Melkor, Balthasar, and all the odd names she knew. But at each the little man explained, That is not my name. The second day the queen inquired of all of her people for uncommon and curious names, and called the dwarf Ribs of Beef, Sheepshank, Whalebone. But at each he said, This is not my name. 
The third day the messenger came back and said, I have not found a single name, but as I came to a high mountain near the edge of a forest where foxes and hares say good night to each other, I saw there a little house, and before the door a fire was burning, and round this fire was a very curious little man, and was dancing on one leg and shouting, Today I stew, then I'll bake, tomorrow I shall the queen's child take. Ah, how famous is that, nobody knows, that my name is Rumpelstiltskin. When the queen heard this, she was very glad, and now she knew the name, and soon after came the dwarf and asked, Now, my lady queen? what is my name first she said are you called conrad no are you called how no are you called rumpelstiltskin a witch has told you a witch has told you shrieked the little man and stamped his foot so hard in the ground with rage that he could not draw it out again then he took hold of his left leg with both his hands and pulled away so hard that his right came off in the struggle and he hopped about howling terribly and from that day to this the queen has heard no more of her troublesome visitor end of rumpelstiltskin by the brothers grimm recording by brian johnson a.k.a. Joe Kooning. Email joekooning at gmail.com The Stone Cutter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Cutter by Laurie Claire Future. Once upon a time there lived a stone cutter who went out every day to a great rock, in the side of a big mountain, and cut out slabs for gravestones, or for houses. He understood very well the kinds of stones wanted for the different purposes, and as he was a careful workman, he had plenty of customers. For a long time he was quite happy and contented, and asked for nothing better than what he had. Now in the mountain dwelt a spirit, which now and then appeared to men, and helped them in many ways to become rich and prosperous. The stone-cutter, however, had never seen this spirit, and only shook his head, with an unbelieving air, when anyone spoke of it. But a time was coming, when he learned to change his opinion. One day the stone-cutter carried a gravestone to the house of a rich man, and saw there all sorts of beautiful things, of which he had never even dreamed. Suddenly his daily work seemed to grow harder and heavier, and he said to himself, Oh, if only I were a rich man, and could sleep in a bed with silken curtains and golden tassels, how happy I should be. And a voice answered him, Your wish is heard, a rich man you shall be. At the sound of the voice the stone-cutter looked round, but could see nobody. He thought it was all his fancy, and picked up his tools and went home, for he did not feel inclined to do any more work that day. But when he reached the little house where he lived, he stood still with amazement, for instead of his wooden hut was a stately palace, filled with splendid furniture and most splendid of all was the bed, in every respect like the one he had envied. He was nearly beside himself with joy, and in his new life the old one was soon forgotten. It was now the beginning of summer, and each day the sun blazed more fiercely. One morning the heat was so great that the stone cutter could scarcely breathe and he determined he would stop at home till the evening. He was rather dull, for he had never learned how to amuse himself, and was peeping through the closed blinds to see what was going on in the street, when a little carriage passed by, drawn by servants, dressed in blue and silver. In the carriage sat a prince, and over his head a golden umbrella was held. To protect him from the sun's rays. Oh, if only a prince, said the stone cutter to himself as the carriage vanished round the corner. Oh, if I were only a prince and could go in such a carriage, 
and have a golden umbrella held over me, how happy I should be. And the voice of the mountain spirit answered, Your wish is heard, a prince you shall be. And a prince he was. Before his carriage rode, one company of men and another behind it. Servants dressed in scarlet and gold bore him along. The coveted umbrella was held over his head. Everything heart could desire was his. But yet it was not enough. He looked round still for something to wish for. And when he saw that in spite of the water he poured on his grass, the rays of the sun scorched it, and that in spite of the umbrella held over his head each day, his face grew browner and browner. He cried in his anger, The sun is mightier than I. Oh, if I were only the sun! And the mountain spirit answered, Your wish is heard, the sun you shall be. And the sun he was, and felt himself proud in his power. He shot his beams above and below, on earth and in heaven, he burnt up the grass in the fields and scorched the faces of princes, as well as of poorer folk. But in a short time he began to grow tired of his might, for there seemed nothing left for him to do. Discontent once more filled his soul, and when a cloud covered his face and hid the earth from him, he cried in his anger, Does the cloud hold captive my rays? Is it mightier than I? Oh, that I were a cloud and mightier than any. And the mountain spirit answered, Your wish is heard, a cloud you shall be. And a cloud he was, and lay between the sun and the earth. He caught the sun's beams and held them, and to his joy the earth grew green again, and flowers blossomed. But that was not enough for him, and for days and weeks he poured forth rain, till the rivers overflowed their banks and the crops of rice stood in water. Towns and villages were destroyed by the power of the rain. Only the great rock on the mountain side remained unmoved. The cloud was amazed at the sight and cried in wonder, Is the rock then mightier than I? Oh, if I were only the rock! And the mountain spirit answered, Your wish is heard, the rock you shall be. And the rock he was, and glorified in his power. Proudly he stood, and neither the heat of the sun nor the force of the rain could move him. This is better than all, he said to himself. But one day he heard a strange noise at his feet. When he looked down, to see what it could be, he saw a stone cutter, driving tools into his surface. Even while he looked, a trembling feeling ran all through him, and a great block broke off and fell upon the ground. Then he cried in his wrath, Is a mere child of earth mightier than a rock? Oh, if I were only a man! And the mountain spirit answered, Your wish is heard, a man once more you shall be. And a man he was, and in the sweat of his brow he toiled again at his trade of stone cutting. His bed was hard and his food scanty, but he had learned to be satisfied with it, and did not long to be something or somebody else. And as he never asked for things he had not got, or desired to be greater and mightier than other people, he was happy at last, and heard the voice of the mountain spirit no longer. End of chapter 1 Prince Kind-Hearted is chapter two of stories to read or tell this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org stories to read or tell by laurie claire fuchsia chapter two prince kind-hearted once upon a time there lived a king who had but one son and he was called the kind-hearted when the prince was twenty years old he asked the king his father, to let him go travelling. His father fitted him out for the journey, gave him a true servant to guard him, and his fatherly blessing. The prince took leave of his father, mounted a brave steed, and went to different countries to see God's world, 
to learn many things and to return home, a wiser and a better man. Once, when the prince was slowly riding through a silent field, he suddenly perceived an eagle in pursuit of a swan. The white swan was almost caught by the eagle's sharp claws, when the prince, carefully aiming, fired his pistol. The eagle fell dead, and the happy swan came down and said, Kind-hearted, I thank you for your help. It is not a swan that is thanking you, but the enchanted daughter of the night invisible. You have not saved me from an eagle's claws, but from the terrible magician King Koshche. My father will pay you well for your services. Remember whenever you are in need to say three times, Night invisible, come to my help. The swan flew away as soon as it had finished speaking, and the prince looked after it, then continued his journey. He crossed many high mountains, traversed deep rivers, passed foreign countries, and at last he came to a great desert, where there was nothing to see but sky and sand. No man lived there. No animal's voice was ever heard, no vegetable ever grew there. The sun was shining so brightly and burning so terribly that all the rivers were dried up. Their beds were lost in the sand, and there was not a drop of water anywhere. The young prince, anxious to go everywhere and see everything, and not noticing how dry things that were, kept going farther and farther, and deeper and deeper, into the desert. But after a while he became terribly thirsty. In order to find some water, he sent his servant in one direction, and he himself went in another. After a long time, he succeeded in finding a well. He called to his servant. I have found a means of getting some water. And they both were happy. But their happiness did not last, for the well was very deep, and they had nothing with which to reach the water. The prince said to his servant, Dismount. I will let you down into the well by some long ropes, and you shall draw up some water. No, my prince, answered the servant. I am much heavier than you are, and your majesty's hands will not be able to hold me. You take hold of the ropes, I will let you down into the well. The prince, the ropes tied around him, went down into the well, drank the cold water, and taking some of it for the servant, pulled the ropes as a sign for the servant to draw him up again. But instead of pulling him up, the servant said, Listen, you, kingly son, from your cradle days until now you have lived a happy life, surrounded by luxury and love, and I have always led the life of a miserable wretch. Now you must agree to become my servant, and I will be the prince instead of you. If you will not exchange, say your last prayer, for I am going to drown you. Do not drown me, my true servant. You will not gain anything by it. You will never find such a good master as I am. And you know what a murderer may expect in the next world. Let me suffer in the next world, but I will make you suffer in this one, answered the servant. And he began to loosen the ropes. Stop, cried the prince. I will be thy servant and you shall be the prince. I will give you my word for it. I do not believe your word. Swear that you will write down what you promise me now. For words are lost in the air, and writing always remains as a testimony against us. I swear. The servant let down into the well a sheet of paper and a pencil, and told the prince to write the following. The bearer of this is Prince Kind-Hearted, travelling with his servant, a subject of his father's kingdom. The servant glanced over the note, pulled the prince out of the well, gave him his shabby clothes and put on the prince's rich dress. Then, having changed armour and horses, they went on. In a week or so, they came to the capital of a certain kingdom. When they approached the palace, the false prince gave his horse to the false servant and told him to go to the stable and he himself went straight into the throne chamber, and said to the king, 
I come to you to ask for the hand of your daughter, whose beauty and wisdom are known all over the world. If you consent, you will have our favour. If not, we will decide it by war. You do not speak to me in a nice way at all, not as a prince ought to speak. But it may be that in your country you are not used to better manners. Now listen to me, my future son-in-law. My kingdom is now in the hands of an enemy of mine. His troops have captured my best soldiers, and now they are approaching my capital. If you will clear my kingdom from these troops, my daughter's hand will be yours, as a reward. All right, answered the false prince. I will drive your enemies away. Do not worry if they come to the capital. Tomorrow morning not one enemy will be left in your land. In the evening he went out of the palace, called his servant and said to him, Listen, my dear, go out to the city walls, drive away the foreign troops, and for this service I will return you your note, by which you denied your kingdom and swore to be my servant. The honest prince, kind-hearted, put on his knightly armour, mounted his steed, went out to the city walls, and called in a loud voice, Knight Invisible, come to my help. Here I am, said Knight Invisible. What do you wish me to do for you? I am ready to do everything for you, because you saved my child from the terrible Koshche. Prince Kind-hearted showed him the troops, and the knight invisible whistled loudly and called, O oh, you, my wise horse, come to me quickly. There was a rustling in the air. It thundered. The earth trembled. And a wonderful horse appeared, having a golden mane. From his nostrils a fire was burning. From his eyes bright sparks were flying. And from his ears thick clouds of smoke were coming. Knight Invisible jumped upon the horse and said to the prince, Take this magic sword and attack the troops from the left, and I upon my golden-maned horse will attack them from the right. They both attacked the army. From the left the soldiers were falling like wood, from the right like whole forests. In less than an hour the entire army vanished. Some of them remained upon the spot, dead. Some of them fled. Prince Kind-hearted and the Knight Invisible met upon the battlefield, shook hands in a friendly way, and in a minute the knight invisible and his horse turned into a bright red flame, then into thick smoke, which disappeared in the darkness. The prince returned quietly to the palace. The young princess felt very sad that evening. She could not sleep and so leaned out of her window. When she overheard the conversation, between the prince and the servant. Then she saw what was going on behind the city walls. She also saw the knight invisible disappear in the darkness, and Prince Kind-hearted return to the palace. She saw the false prince coming out of the palace, taking the knightly armour from the servant, and Prince Kind-hearted entering the stable to rest. The next morning the old king, seeing his land freed from the enemies, felt very happy, and gave the prince many rich presents. But when he announced the engagement of his daughter to him, she stood up, took the hand of the real prince, who helped to serve at the table, led him before the old king, and said, My dearest father and king, and all you that are present here, this man is my bridegroom sent to me by God. For he is your saviour and the real prince. And that one, who calls himself a prince, is a traitor, a false and dishonest man. Then the princess told everything she knew, and said, Let him show some proof that he really is a prince. The false prince gave to the king the note, which was given to him in the well. The king opened it and read aloud, The bearer of this note, the false and untrue servant of Prince Kind-hearted, asks for pardon and expects a just punishment. 
the note was given to him in the well by Prince Kindhearted. Is it really so? cried the wretch, and he became pale as death. Yes, read it yourself, if you do not believe it, answered the king. I cannot read, said the poor fellow. He knelt before his master and begged for mercy, but he received what he deserved. Prince Kindhearted and the princess were happily married, and I was present at the wedding feast, and also felt happy. End of chapter 2 Prince Kindhearted The Frog Prince by the Brother Grimm This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frog Prince by the Brother Grimm One fine evening a young princess put on her bonnet and clocks and went out to take a walk by herself in a wood. And when she came to a cool spring, of water she rose in the midst of it she sat herself down to rest a while now she had a golden ball in her hand which was her favorite plaything and she was always tossing it up into the air and catching it again as it fell after a time she threw it up so high that she missed catching it as it fell and the ball bounded away and rolled along upon the ground till at last it fell down into the spring. The princess looked into the spring after her ball, but it was very deep, so deep, that she could not see the bottom of it. Then she began to bewail her loss, and said, Alas, if I could only get my ball again, I would give all my fine clothes and jewels and everything I have, everything I have in the world. While she was speaking, a frog puts its head out of the water and said, Princess, why do you weep so bitterly? Alas, said she, what can you do for me, you nasty frog? My golden ball has fallen into the spring. The frog said, I want not your pearls and jewels and fine clothes, but if you will love me and let me live with you and eat from of your golden plate and sleep upon your bed, I will bring your ball again. What nonsense, thought the princess. This is a city frog is talking. He can never even get out of the spring to visit me, though he may be able to get my ball for me, and therefore I will tell him he shall have what he asks. So she said to the frog, Well, if you will bring me my ball, I will de do all you ask. Then the frog put his head down and dived deep under the water and after a little time he came up again with a ball in his mouth and threw it on the edge of the spring. As soon as the young princess saw her ball she ran to pick it up and she was so overjoyed to have it in her hand and again that she never thought of the frog but ran home with it as fast as she could. The frog called after her, Stay, princess, and take me with you, as you said. But she did not stop to hear a word. The next day, just as the princess had sat down to dinner, she heard a strange noise. Tap, tap, splash, splash, as if something was coming up the marble staircase. And soon afterwards, there was a gentle knock at the door, and a little voice cried out and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door, thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said, by the fountain cool, in the greenwood shed. Then the princess ran to the door and opened it, and there she saw the frog, whom she had quite forgotten. At this sight she was sadly frightened, and shutting the door as fast as she could, came back to her seat. The king, her father, seeing that something had frightened her, asked her what was the matter. There's a nasty frog, said she, at the door that lifted my ball from me out of the spring this morning. I told him that he should live with me here, thinking that he could never get out of the spring. But 
There he is at the door, and he wants to come in. While she was speaking, the frog knocked again at the door and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shed. Then the king said to the young princess, As you have given your word, you must keep it, so go and let him in. She did so, and the frog hopped into the room, and then straight on, tap, tap, splash, splash, from the bottom of the room to the top, till he came up close to the table where the princess sat. Pray, lift me upon chair, said he to the princess, and let me sit next to you. As soon as she had done this, the frog said, Put your plate nearer to me, that I may eat of it. This she did, and when he had eaten as much as he could, he said, Now I am tired, carry me upstairs, and put me into your bed. And the princess thought very unwillingly, took him up in her hand, and put him upon the pillow of her own bed, where he slept all night long. As soon as it was light, he jumped up, hopped downstairs, and went out of the house. Now then, thought the princess, at last he's gone, and I shall be troubled with him no more. But she was mistaken, for when night came again, she heard the same tapping at the door, and the frog came once more and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shed. And when the princess opened the door, the frog came in and slept upon her pillow as before till the morning broke. And the third night he did the same. But when the princess awoke on the following morning, she was astonished to see, instead of the frog, a handsome prince gazing on her with the most beautiful eyes she had ever seen and standing at the head of her bread. He told her that he had been enchanted by a spiteful fairy who had changed him into a frog, and that he had been fated so to abide till some princess should take him out of the spring and let him eat from her blade and sleep upon her bed for three nights. You, said the prince, have broken this cruel charm, and now I have nothing to wish for but that you should go with me into my father's kingdom where I will marry you and love you as long as you live. The young princess, you may be sure, was not long in saying yes to all this, and as they spoke, a gay coach drove up with eight beautiful horses and decked with the plums of feathers and a golden harness, and behind the coach rode the prince's servant, faithful Heinrich, who had bewailed the misfortunes of his dear masters during his enchantment so long and so bitterly that his heart had well nigh burst. They then took leave of the king and got into the coach with eight horses and all set out full of joy and merriment for the prince's kingdom, which they reached safely, and there they lived happily a great many years. The end. A selection of limericks from a book of nonsense by Edward Lear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Zoe Shenman Carly Wiggins and Leif Shenman There was an old man who supposed that the street door was partially closed, but some very large rats ate his coat and his hats while that trial old gentleman dozed.
There was an old man of the Isles whose face was pervaded with smiles. He sang hi dum diddle and played on the fiddle, that amiable man of the Isles. There was an old person of Tartary who divided his jugular artery, but he screeched to his wife and she said, Oh my life, your death will be felt by all Tartary. There was an old person of Prague who was suddenly seized with the plague, but they gave him some butter, which caused him to mutter and cured that old person of Prague. There was an old man of Peru who watched his wife making a stew. But once by mistake, in a stove she did bake that unfortunate man of Peru. There was an old man of Leghorn, the smallest that ever was born. But quickly snapped up, he was once by a puppy who devoured that old man of Leghorn. There was an old man of Hague whose ideas were excessively vague. He built a balloon to examine the moon that deluded old man of Hague. There was a young lady of Turkey who wept when the weather was murky. When the day turned out fine, she ceased to repine, that capricious young lady of Turkey. <laughs> there was a young lady of Norway who casually sat in a doorway. When the door squeezed her flat, she exclaimed, What of that? This courageous young lady of Norway. There was a young lady whose nose was so long that it reached to her toes. She hired an old lady whose conduct was steady to carry that wonderful nose. There was an old man of Quebec. A beetle ran over his neck, but he cried with a needle, I'll slay you, old beetle, that angry old man of Quebec. There was a young lady of pool who soup was excessively cool. So she put it to boil by the aid of some oil. That ingenious young lady of pool. There was a young lady of Parma whose conduct grew calmer and calmer when they said are you dumb she merely said hum that provoking young lady of parma there was an old man with a poker who painted his face with red ochre when they said you're a guy he made no reply but knocked them all down with his poker there was an old person of Sparta who had 25 sons and one daughter. He fed them all snails and weighed them in scales. That wonderful person of Sparta. There was an old man on whose nose most b birds of the air could repose. Mm -hmm but they all flew away at the closing of day, which relieved that old man and his nose. There was an old man of the north who fell into a basin of broth, but a laudable cook fished him out with a hook, which saved that old man of the north. There was an old person of trings who embellished his nose with a ring. He gazed at the moon every evening in June that 
ecstatic old person of tree. There was an old man of Aosta who possessed a large cow, but he lost her. But they said, don't you see, she has run up a tree, you invidious old man of Aosta. There was an old man from Nile who sharpened his nails with a file till he cut off his thumbs and said calmly, this comes of sharpening one's nails with a file. There was an old person of Troy whose drink was warm brandy and soy, which he took with a spoon by the light of the moon in sight of the city of Troy. There was an old man of Cape Horn who wished he had never been born, so he sat on a chair till he died of despair. That doorless man of Cape Horn. There was a young person of Crete whose toilet was far from complete. She dressed in a sack speckle speckled with black, that umbliferous person of Crete. There was an old man of a bruisey, so blind that he couldn't his foot see. When they said, that's your toe, he replied, is it so that doleful old man of the abuse? There was an old person of mold who shrank from sensations of cold, so he purchased some muffs, some furs, and some fluffs, and wrapped himself well from the cold. There was an old person of Cromer who stood on one leg to read Homer when he found he grew stiff. He jumped over the cliff, which concluded that person of Cromer. There was a young lady of Clare who was madly pursued by a bear. When she found she was tired, she abruptly expired, that unfortunate lady of Clare. There was an old man of Calcutta who perpetually ate bread and butter till a great bit of muffin on which he was stuffing choked that horrid old man of Calcutta. End of selections from a book of nonsense by Edward Lear. The Tale of the Pointer Tray by Laurie Claire Fouchier. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tale of the Pointer Tray by Laurie Claire Fouchier. In a voyage which I made to the East Indies with Captain Hamilton, I took a favourite pointer with me. He was, to use a common phrase, worth his weight in gold, for he never deceived me. One day, when we were, by the best observations we could make, at least three hundred leagues from land, my dog pointed. I observed him for nearly an hour, with astonishment, and mentioned the circumstance to the captain and every officer on board, asserting that we must be near land, for my dog smelt game. This occasioned a general laugh, but that did not alter in the least the good opinion I had of my dog. After much conversation, pro and con, I boldly told the captain that I placed more confidence in Trey's nose that I did in the eyes of every seaman on board, and therefore boldly proposed laying the sum I had agreed to pay for my passage, viz. one hundred guineas, that we should find game within half an hour. The captain, a good hearty fellow, laughed again, desired Mr. Crawford, the surgeon, who was prepared, to feel my pulse. 
He did so and reported me in perfect health. The following dialogue between them took place. I overheard it, though spoken low and at some distance. Captain. His brain is turned, I cannot with honour, accept his wager. Surgeon. I am of a different opinion. He is quite sane, and depends more upon the scent of his dog than he will upon the judgment of all the officers on board. He will certainly lose, and he richly merits it. Captain. Such a wager cannot be fair on my side. However, I'll take him up if I return his money afterwards. During the above conversation, Trey continued in the same situation, and confirmed me, still more, in my opinion. I proposed the wager a second time. It was then accepted. Done and done were scarcely said on both sides, when some sailors who were fishing in the longboat, which was made fast to the stern of the ship, harpooned an exceedingly large shark, which they brought on board, and began to cut up for the purpose of barrelling the oil, when, behold, they found no less than six brace of live partridges in this animal's stomach. They had been so long in that situation that one of the hens was sitting upon four eggs, and a fifth was hatching when the shark was opened. This young bird was brought up by placing it with a litter of kittens that came into the world a few minutes before. The old cat was as fond of it as any of her own four-legged progeny and made herself very unhappy when it flew out of her reach till it returned again. As to the other partridges, there were four hens amongst them one or more were, during the voyage, constantly sitting, and consequently we had plenty of game at the captain's table. And in gratitude to poor Trey, for being the means of winning one hundred guineas, I ordered him the bones daily, and sometimes a whole bird. End of The Tale of the Pointer Trey The Pigtail by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Mills. The Pigtail by Lewis Carroll. There was a pig that sat alone beside a ruined pump. By day and night he made his moan. It would have stirred a heart of stone. To see him wring his hoofs and groan, Because he could not jump. A certain camel heard him shout, A camel with a hump, Oh, is it grief, or is it gout? What is this bellowing about? That pig replied with quivering snout, Because I cannot jump. That camel scanned him, dreamy-eyed, Methinks you are too plump. I never knew a pig so wide, that wobbled so from side to side, who could, however much he tried, to do such a thing as jump. Yet mark those trees two miles away, all clustered in a clump. If you could trot there twice a day, nor ever pause for rest or play, in the far future, who can say, you may be fit to jump. That camel passed, and left him there beside the ruined pump. Oh, horrid was that pig's despair! His shrieks of anguish filled the air. He wrung his hoofs, he rent his hair, because he could not jump. There was a frog that wandered by, a sleek and shining lump, inspected him with fishy eye, and said, O oh, pig, what makes you cry? And bitter was that pig's reply, Because I cannot jump. That frog he grinned a grin of glee, and hit his chest a thump. O oh, pig! he said, be ruled by me, and you shall see what you shall see. This minute, for a trifling fee, I'll teach you how to jump. You may be faint from many a fall, and bruised by many a bump, but if you persevere through all, and practice first on something small, 
concluding with a ten-foot wall, you'll find that you can jump. That pig looked up with joyful start. Oh, frog, you are a trump. Your words have healed my inward smart. Come, name your fee and do your part. Bring comfort to a broken heart by teaching me to jump. My fee shall be a mutton chop. My goal, this ruined pump. Observe with what an airy flop I plant myself upon the top. Now bend your knees and take a hop, for that's the way to jump. Up rose that pig and rushed full whack against the ruined pump, rolled over like an empty sack and settled down upon his back, while all his bones at once went crack. It was a fatal jump. That camel passed as day grew dim around the ruined pump. Oh, broken heart! Oh, broken limb! It needs, that camel said to him, something more fairy-like and slim to execute a jump. That pig lay still as any stone, and could not stir a stump, nor ever, if the truth were known, was he again observed to moan, nor ever wring his hoofs and groan, because he could not jump. That frog made no remark, for he was dismal as a dump. He knew the consequence must be that he would never get his fee, and still he sits in misery upon that ruined pump. End of The Pigtail The Velveteen Rabbit This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sabrina Sterling The Velveteen Rabbit by Marjorie Williams There was once a velveteen rabbit, and in the beginning he was really splendid. He was fat and bunchy, as a rabbit should be. His coat was spotted brown and white. He had real thread whiskers, and his ears were lined with pink sateen. On Christmas morning, when he sat wedged in the top of the boy's stocking, with a sprig of holly between his paws, the effect was charming. There were other things in the stocking, nuts and oranges and a toy engine and chocolate almonds and a clockwork mouse, but the rabbit was quite the best of all. For at least two hours, the boy loved him, and then aunts and uncles came to dinner and there was a great rustling of tissue paper and unwrapping of parcels. And in the excitement of looking at all the new presents, the velveteen rabbit was forgotten. For a long time, he lived in the toy cupboard or on the nursery floor, and no one thought very much about him. He was naturally shy, and being only made of velveteen, some of the more expensive toys quite snubbed him. The mechanical toys were very superior, and looked down upon everyone else. They were full of modern ideas, and pretended they were real. The model boat, who had lived through two seasons and lost most of his paint, caught the tone from them, and never missed an opportunity of referring to his rigging in technical terms. The rabbit could not claim to be a model of anything for he didn't know that real rabbits existed. For he thought they were all stuffed with sawdust like himself, and he understood that sawdust was quite out of date and should never be mentioned in modern circles. Even Timothy, the jointed wooden lion, who was made by the disabled soldiers and should have had broader views, put on airs and pretended he was connected with government. Between them all, the poor little rabbit was made to feel very insignificant and commonplace, and the only person who was kind to him at all was the skin horse. The skin horse had lived longer in the nursery than any of the others. He was so old that his brown coat was bald in patches and showed the seams underneath, and most of the hairs on his tail had been pulled out to string bead necklaces. He was wise, for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive to boast and swagger, and by and by break their mainsprings 
and pass away, and he knew that they were only toys, and would never turn into anything else. For nursery magic is very strange and wonderful, and only playthings that are old and wise and experienced like the skin horse understand all about it. What is real? asked the rabbit one day, when they were laying side by side near the nursery fender, before Nana came to tidy the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick-out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up? he asked. Or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily, or have sharp edges, or have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. I suppose you are real said the rabbit, and then he wished he had not said it, for he thought the skin horse might be sensitive. But the skin horse only smiled. The boy's uncle made me real, he said. That was a great many years ago, but once you are real, you can't become unreal again. It lasts for always. The rabbit sighed. He thought it would be a long time before this magic called real happened to him. He longed to become real, to know what it felt like, and yet the idea of growing shabby and losing his eyes and whiskers was rather sad. He wished he could become it without these uncomfortable things happening to him. There was a person called Nana who ruled the nursery. Sometimes she took no notice of the playthings lying about, and sometimes for no reason whatever, she went swooping about like a giant wind and hustled them away in cupboards. She called this tidying up, and the playthings all hated it, especially the tin ones. The rabbit didn't mind it so much, for wherever he was thrown, he came down soft. One evening, when the boy was going to bed, he couldn't find the china dog that always slept with him. Nana was in a hurry and it was too much trouble to hunt for china dogs at bedtime, so she simply looked about her, and seeing that the toy cupboard door stood open, she made a swoop. Here, she said, take your old bunny, he'll do to sleep with you, and she dragged the rabbit out by one ear and put him into the boy's arms. That night, and for many nights after, the velveteen rabbit slept in the boy's bed. At first, he found it rather uncomfortable for the boy hugged him very tight, and sometimes he rolled over on him, and sometimes he pushed him so far under the pillow that the rabbit could scarcely breathe. And he missed, too, those long moonlight hours in the nursery, when all the house was silent and his talks were the skin horse. But very soon he grew to like it, for the boy used to talk to him and made nice tunnels for him under the bedclothes that he said were like the burrows that real rabbits lived in, and they had splendid games together in whispers when Nana had gone away to her supper and left the nightlight burning on the mantelpiece. And when the boy dropped off to sleep, the rabbit would snuggle down close under his little warm chin and dream, with the boy's hands clasped close round him all night long. And so time went on, and the little rabbit was very happy so happy that he never noticed how his beautiful velveteen fur was getting shabbier and shabbier, and his tail becoming unsewn, and all the pink rubbed off his nose where the boy had kissed him. Spring came, and they had long days in the garden, 
for wherever the boy went, the rabbit went too. He had rides in the wheelbarrow and picnics on the grass, and lovely fairy huts built for him under the raspberry canes behind the flower border. And once, when the boy was called away suddenly to go to tea, the rabbit was left out on the lawn until long after dusk, and Nana had come to look for him with the candle, because the boy couldn't go to sleep unless he was there. He was wet through with the dew, and was quite earthy from diving into the burrows the boy had made for him in the flower bed. And Nana grumbled as she rubbed him off with a corner of her apron. You must have your old bunny, she said. Fancy all that fuss for a toy. The boy sat up in bed and stretched out his hands. Give me my bunny, he said. You mustn't say that. He isn't a toy. He's real. When the little rabbit heard that, he was happy, for he knew what the skin horse had said was true at last. The nursery magic had happened to him, and he was a toy no longer. He was real. The boy himself had said it. That night, he was almost too happy to sleep, and so much love stirred in his little sawdust heart that it almost burst. And into his button eyes, that had long ago lost their polish, there came a look of wisdom and beauty, so that even Nana noticed it next morning when she picked him up and said, I declare if that old bunny hasn't got quite a knowing expression. That was a wonderful summer. Near the house where they lived, there was a wood, and in the long June evenings the boy liked to go there after tea to play. He took the velveteen rabbit with him, and before he wandered off to pick flowers or play at brigands among the trees, he always made the rabbit a little nest, somewhere among the bracken, where he could be quite cosy, for he was a kind-hearted little boy, and he liked Bunny to be comfortable. One evening, while the rabbit was laying there alone, watching the ants that run to and fro between his velvet paws in the grass, he saw two strange beings creep out of the tall bracken near him. They were rabbits like himself, but quite furry and brand new. They must have been very well made, for their seams didn't show at all, and they changed shape in a queer way, and they moved. One minute they were long and thin, and the next minute fat and bunchy. Instead of always staying the same like he did, their feet padded softly on the ground, and they crept quite close to him, twitching their noses, while the rabbit stared hard to see which side the clockwork stuck out, for he knew that people who jump generally have something to wind them up, but he couldn't see it. They were evidently a new kind of rabbit altogether. They stared at him, and the little rabbit stared back, and all the time their noses twitched. Why don't you get up and play with us? One of them asked. I don't feel like it, said the rabbit, for he didn't want to explain that he had no clockwork. Ho, oh, said the furry rabbit. It's easy as anything. And he gave a big hop sideways and stood on his hind legs. I don't believe you can, he said. I can, said the little rabbit. I can jump higher than anything. He meant when the boy threw him, but of course he didn't want to say so. Can you hop on your hind legs? asked the furry rabbit. That was a dreadful question, for the velveteen rabbit had no hind legs at all. The back of him was made all one piece, like a pincushion. He sat still in the bracken and hoped that the other rabbits wouldn't notice. I don't want to, he said again. But the wild rabbits have very sharp eyes, and this one stretched out his neck and looked. He hasn't got any hind legs, he called out. Fancy a rabbit without any hind legs! <laughs> and he began to laugh. I have got hind legs, cried the little rabbit. I am sitting on them. Then stretch them out and show me, like this, said the wild rabbit. And he began to whirl around and dance, until the little rabbit got quite dizzy. I don't like dancing, he said. I'd rather sit still. But all the while he was longing to dance, for a funny new tickly feeling ran through him, and he felt he would give anything in the world to be able to jump about like these rabbits did. The strange rabbit stopped dancing, and came quite close. He came so close this time, that his long whiskers brushed the velveteen rabbit's ear, and then he wrinkled his nose suddenly, and flattened his ears, and jumped backwards. 
He doesn't smell right, he exclaimed. He isn't a rabbit at all. He isn't real. I am real, said the little rabbit. I am real. The boy said so. And he nearly began to cry. Just then, there was a sound of footsteps, and the boy ran past near them, and with a stamp of feet and a flash of white tails, the two strange rabbits disappeared. Come back and play with me, called the little rabbit. Oh, do come back. I know I'm real. But there was no answer. Only the little ants ran to and fro, and the bracken swayed gently where the two strangers had passed. The velveteen rabbit was all alone. Oh dear, he thought. Why did they run away like that? Why couldn't they stop and talk to me? For a long time he lay very still, watching the bracken, and hoping that they would come back. But they never returned, and presently the sun sank lower, and the little white moth spluttered out, and the boy came and carried him home. Weeks passed, and the little rabbit grew very old and shabby, but the boy loved him just as much. He loved him so hard that he loved all his whiskers off, and the pink lining to his ears turned grey, and his brown spots faded. He even began to lose his shape, and he scarcely looked like a rabbit any more, except to the boy. To him he was always beautiful, and that was all that the little rabbit cared about. He didn't mind how he looked to other people, because the nursery magic had made him real. And when you are real, shabbiness doesn't matter. And then, one day, the boy was ill. His face grew very flushed, and he talked in his sleep, and his little body was so hot that it burned the rabbit when he held him close. Strange people came and went in the nursery, and a light burned all through the night, and through it all, the little velveteen rabbit lay there, hidden from sight under the bedclothes, and he never stirred, for he was afraid that if they found him, someone might take him away, and he knew that the boy needed him. It was a very long weary time, for the boy was too ill to play, and the little rabbit found it rather dull, with nothing to do all day long, but he snuggled down patiently, and he looked forward to the time when the boy should be well again, and they would go out into the garden amongst the flowers and the butterflies and play splendid games in the raspberry thicket like they used to. All sorts of delightful things he planned, and when the boy lay half asleep, he crept up close to the pillow and whispered them in his ear, and presently the fever turned, and the boy got better. He was able to sit up in bed and look at picture books, while the little rabbit cuddled close at his side, and one day they let him get up and dress. It was a bright sunny morning, and the window stood wide open. They had carried the boy out onto the balcony, wrapped in a shawl, and the little rabbit lay tangled up among the bedclothes, thinking. The boy was going to the seaside tomorrow. Everything was arranged, and now it only remained to carry out the doctor's orders. They talked about it all, while the little rabbit lay under the bedclothes, with just his head peeping out and listened. The room was to be disinfected, and all the books and toys that the boy had played with in his bed must be burnt. Hurrah! thought the little rabbit. Tomorrow we shall go to the seaside. For the boy had often talked to the seaside, and he wanted very much to see the big waves coming in, and the tiny crabs and the sand castles. Just then, Nana caught sight of him. How about his old bunny? she asked. That, said the doctor. Why, it's a mass of scarlet fever germs. Burn it at once. What? Nonsense. Get him a new one. He mustn't have that any more. And so the little rabbit was put into a sack with the old picture books and a lot of rubbish, and carried out to the end of the garden behind the fowl house. That was a fine place to make a bonfire, only the gardener was too busy just then to attend to it. He had the potatoes to dig and the green peas to gather, but next morning he promised to come early and burn the whole lot. That night, the boy slept in a different bedroom and he had a new bunny to sleep with him. It was a very splendid bunny, all white plush with real glass eyes, but the boy was too excited to care very much about it, for tomorrow he was going to the seaside, and that in itself was such a wonderful thing, he could think of nothing else. And while the boy was asleep, dreaming of the seaside, 
The little rabbit lay among the old picture books in the corner behind the fowl house, and he felt very lonely. The sack had been left untied, and so by wriggling a bit, he was able to get his head out through the opening and look out. He was shivering a little, for he had always been used to sleeping in a proper bed, and by this time his coat had worn so thin and so threadbare from hugging that it was no longer any protection to him. Nearby he could see the thicket of raspberry canes growing tall and close like a tropical jungle, in whose shadow he had played with the boy on bygone mornings. He thought of those long sunlit hours in the garden, how happy they were, and a great sadness came over him. He seemed to see them all pass before him, each more beautiful than the other, the fairy huts in the flower bed, the quiet evenings in the wood when he lay in the bracken and the little ants ran over his paws, the wonderful day when he first knew that he was real. He thought of the skin horse, so wise and gentle, and all that he had told him. Of what use was it to be loved and lose one's beauty and become real, if it all ended like this? And a tear, a real tear, trickled down his shabby velvet nose and fell to the ground. And then a strange thing happened, for where the tear had fallen, a flower grew out of the ground, a mysterious flower not at all like any that grew in the garden. It had slender green leaves, the colour of emeralds, and in the centre of the leaves a blossom like a golden cup. It was so beautiful that the little rabbit forgot to cry, and just lay there watching it, and presently the blossom opened and out of it there stepped a fairy. She was quite the loveliest fairy in the whole world. Her dress was of pearl and dewdrops, and there were flowers around her neck and in her hair, and her face was like the most perfect flower of all. And she came close to the little rabbit and gathered him up in her arms and kissed him on his velveteen nose that was all damp from crying. Little rabbit, she said, don't you know who I am? The rabbit looked up at her, and it seemed to him that he had seen her face before, but he couldn't think where. I am the nursery magic fairy, she said. I take care of all the playthings that the children have loved. When they are old and worn out and the children don't need them any more, then I come and take them away with me and turn them into real. Wasn't I real before? asked the little rabbit. You were real to the boy, the fairy said, because he loved you. Now you shall be real to everyone. And she held the little rabbit close in her arms and flew with him into the wood. It was light now, for the moon had risen. All of the forest was beautiful, and the fronds of the bracken shone like frosted silver. In the open glade between the tree trunks, the wild rabbits danced with their shadows on the velvet grass, but when they saw the fairy, they all stopped dancing and stood round in a ring to stare at her. I've brought you a new playfellow, the fairy said. You must be very kind to him and teach him all he needs to know in rabbit land, for he is going to live with you for ever and ever. And she kissed the little rabbit again and put him down on the grass. Run and play, little rabbit, she said. But the little rabbit sat quite still for a moment and never moved. For when he saw all the wild rabbits dancing around him, he suddenly remembered about his hind legs, and he didn't want them to see that he was all made in one piece. He did not know that when the fairy kissed him the last time, she had changed him altogether. And he might have sat there a long time too shy to move if just then something hadn't tickled his nose, and before he thought what he was doing, he lifted his hind toe to scratch it, and he found he actually had hind legs. Instead of dingy velveteen he had brown fur, soft and shiny, his ears twitched by themselves, and his whiskers were so long that they brushed the grass. He gave one leap, and the joy of using those hind legs was so great that he went springing about the turf on them, jumping sideways and whirling round as the others did, and he grew so excited that when at last he did stop to look for the fairy, she had gone. He was a real rabbit at last, at home with the other rabbits. Autumn passed, and winter, and in the spring, 
When the days grew warm and sunny, the boy went out to play in the wood behind the house. And while he was playing, two rabbits crept out from the bracken and peeped at him. One of them was brown all over, but the other had strange markings under his fur, as though long ago he had been spotted, and the spots still showed through. And about his little soft nose and his round black eyes, there was something familiar, so the boy thought to himself. Why, he looks just like my old bunny that was lost when I had scarlet fever. But he never knew it really was his own bunny, come back to look at the child who first helped him to be real. The End The End of the Velveteen Rabbit Recording by Sabrina Sterling Email sabrina at voicexoxo.com Website www.voicexoxo.com The Oak Tree and the Ivy by Eugene Field This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Oak Tree and the Ivy by Eugene Field In the greenwood stood a mighty oak. So majestic was he that all who came that way paused to admire his strength and beauty, and all the other trees of the greenwood acknowledged him to be their monarch. Now it came to pass that the ivy loved the oak tree, and inclining her graceful tendrils where he stood, she crept about his feet and twined herself around his sturdy and knotted trunk, and the oak tree pitied the ivy. Oh, ho, he cried, laughing boisterously, but good-naturedly. Oh, ho, so you love me, do you, little vine? Very well, then, play about my feet and I will keep the storms from you, and I will tell you pretty stories about the clouds, the birds, and the stars. The ivy marveled greatly at the strange stories the oak tree told. They were stories the oak tree heard from the wind that loitered around his lofty head and whispered to the leaves of his topmost branches. Sometimes the story was about the great ocean in the east, sometimes of the broad prairies in the west, sometimes of the ice king who lived in the north, and sometimes of the flower queen who dwelt in the south. Then, too, the moon told a story to the oak tree every night, or at least every night that she came to the greenwood, which was very often. But the greenwood is a very charming spot, as we all know. And the oak tree repeated to the ivy every story the moon told, and every song the stars sang. Pray, what are the winds saying now? What song is that I hear? The ivy would ask, and then the oak tree would repeat the story or the song, and the ivy would listen in great wonderment. Whenever the storms came, the oak tree cried to the little ivy, Cling close to me, and no harm shall befall you. See how strong I am? The tempest does not so much as stir me. I mock its fury. Then seeing how strong and brave he was, the ivy hugged him closely. His brown, rugged breast protected her from every harm, and she was secure. The years went by. How quickly they flew. Spring, summer, winter, and then again spring, summer, winter. Our life is short in the greenwood, as elsewhere. And now the ivy was no longer a weakly little vine to excite the pity of the passer-by. Her thousand beautiful arms had twined hither and thither about the oak tree, covering his brown and knotted trunk, shooting forth a bright, delicious foliage, and stretching far up among his lower branches. Then the oak tree's pity grew into a love for the ivy, and the ivy was filled with a great joy. And the oak tree and the ivy were wed one June night, and there was a wonderful celebration in the greenwood. And there was most beautiful music, in which the pine trees, the crickets, the katydids, the frogs, and the nightingales joined with pleasing harmony. The oak tree was always good and gentle to the ivy. There's a storm coming over the hill, he would say. The east wind tells me so. The swallows fly low in the air, and the sky is dark. Cling close to me, my beloved, and no harm shall befall you. Then confidently, and with an always growing love, the ivy would cling more closely to the oak tree, and no harm came to her. How good the oak tree is to the ivy! said the other trees of the greenwood. The ivy heard them, and she loved the oak tree more and more. And although the ivy was now the most umbrageous and luxuriant vine in all the greenwood, the oak tree regarded her still as the tender little thing he had laughingly called to his feet that spring day, many years before, the same little ivy he had told about the stars, the clouds, and the birds. And just as patiently as in those days he had told her of these things, he now repeated other tales the wind whispered to his topmost boughs, tales of the ocean in the east, the prairies in the west, the ice king in the north, and the flower queen in the south. Nestling upon his brave breast and in his stout arms, the ivy heard him tell these wondrous things, and she never wearied with listening. How the oak tree loves her, said the ash. 
the lazy vine has not to do but to twine herself about the arrogant oak tree and hear him tell his wondrous stories the ivy heard these envious words and they made her very sad but she said nothing of them to the oak tree and that night the oak tree rocked her to sleep as he repeated the lullaby a zephyr was singing to him there's a storm coming over the hills said the oak tree one day the east wind tells me so the swallows fly low in the air and the sky is dark clasp me round about with thy dear arms my beloved and nestle close unto my bosom and no harm shall befall thee i have no fear murmured the ivy and she clasped her arms most closely about him and nestled unto his bosom the storm came over the hills and swept down upon the greenwood with deafening thunder and vivid lightning the storm king himself rode upon the blast his horses breathed flames and his chariot trailed through the air like a serpent of fire the ash fell before the violence of the storm king's fury and the cedars groaning fell and the hemlocks and the pines but the oak tree alone quailed not oh ho cried the storm king angrily the oak tree does not bow to me he does not tremble in my presence well we shall see with that the storm king hurled a mighty thunderbolt at the oak tree and the brave strong monarch of the greenwood was riven then with a shout of triumph the storm king rode away dear oak tree you are riven by the storm king's thunderbolt cried the ivy in anguish ay said the oak tree feebly my end has come see i am shattered and helpless but i am unhurt remonstrated the ivy and i will bind up your wounds and nurse you back to health and vigour and so it was that although the oak tree was ever afterward a riven and broken thing the ivy concealed the scars upon his shattered form and covered his wounds all over with her soft foliage i had hoped dear one she said to grow up to thy height and to live with thee among the clouds and to hear the solemn voices thou didst hear thou wouldst love me better then but the oak tree said nay nay my beloved i love thee better as thou art for with thy beauty and thy love thou comfortest mine age then would the ivy tell quaint stories to the old and broken oak tree stories she had learned from the crickets the bees the butterflies and the mice when she was an humble little vine and played at the foot of the majestic oak tree towering in the green wood with no thought of the tiny shoot that crept toward him with her love and these simple tales pleased the old and riven oak tree they were not as heroic as the tales the winds the clouds and the stars told but they were far sweeter for they were tales of contentment of humility of love so the old age of the oak tree was grander than his youth and all who went through the greenwood paused to behold and admire the beauty of the oak tree then for about his seared and broken trunk the gentle vine had so entwined her graceful tendrils and spread her fair foliage that one saw not the havoc of years nor the ruin of the tempest but only the glory of the oak tree's age which was the ivy's love and ministering end of the oak tree and the ivy a farmer's wife the story of ruth by j h willard this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by bologna times a farmer's wife the story of ruth by j h willard in the district called ephrath belonging to the tribe of judah stood the city of bethlehem or house of bread it was a city with walls and gates and lay between fruitful hills and well-watered valleys there among pleasant cornfields and pasture lands lived a man named elimelech which means my god is my king he was descended from one of the princes of judah and was a man of means and consequence elimelech's wife was named naomi meaning pleasant and they had two sons whose names were malan and chilion this old and noble family lived in this fertile region amid pleasant surroundings and with happy prospects until one of the frequent famines that were brought on by want of rain visited their district leaving the parched and sterile fields around bethlehem elimelech and his family and his flocks left their home and settled in the rich and well-watered lands of the moabites beyond the jordan as a wealthy foreigner he probably was well received by the people of moab and secured good pasturage for his sheep and cattle but much trouble was in store for this family notwithstanding its wealth had enabled them to leave their own famine-stricken lands first Elimelech 
died, and the family was without a head. Then Malin married a beautiful woman of the country in which he was then living, named Ruth, and his brother Chilion married another named Orpah. Such marriages were against the law of Moses, because the Moabites worshipped idols, but as the nation was descended from Lot, the nephew of Abraham, the marriages were not so bad as they would have been with women belonging to other of the different tribes of Canaan. After a while, both of the sons of Naomi died, and she was left a childless widow in a strange land. By her gracious ways she had won the affection of both Ruth and Orpah, and now sorrow locked their hearts together in sympathy. At length Naomi turned her longing eyes to her old home in Bethlehem. Ten years had come and gone since she left it, and now the news had reached her that there was plenty of food there. Naomi and her two daughters-in-law started on their way to the land of Judah. After a while, thinking that they had accompanied her far enough, Naomi bade Ruth and Orpah return to their own mother's homes, and spoke very kindly to them. She kissed them, and would have taken leave of them, but they insisted that they would go with her to the home of her own people. Then Naomi suggested that they would not be welcome at Bethlehem, because they were Moabites. They would be looked upon with reproach, strangers in a strange land, and again she pleaded with them to go home, lest their love for her should prove a sorrow to them. Orpah was persuaded to return, and settled down among her kindred, and probably did so from a sense of duty. But Ruth would not leave Naomi, although her mother-in-law gave her one more opportunity to go back to Moab. The chief cause for separation, according to Naomi, was not that they belonged to different races, but that they did not worship the same God. But Ruth, in words at once pathetic and sincere, unselfish in spirit and expression, declared her resolve. Entreat me not to leave thee, and to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught by death part thee and me. Ruth gave up father and mother, friends and relatives, religion and country, and chose poverty and a life among strangers because of her love for Naomi, and her trust in Naomi's God. They reached Bethlehem about the beginning of the barley harvest, and secured some kind of a home. The city of Bethlehem was stirred by the return of Naomi. She had left them accompanied by husband and sons, and in prosperity. She returned, altered in circumstances, changed in appearance, and accompanied only by a Moabitish woman. Her friends could hardly believe their eyes, and exclaimed, Is this Naomi? To which she would reply, Call me not Naomi, pleasant, call me Mara, bitter, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. There was much surprise shown at the return of Naomi with Ruth, but there is no record that people were helpful or even kind to them, and probably the first thing they had to do was to secure food. As it was harvest time, Ruth volunteered to go into the fields and glean, and so, one morning, she went forth as an alien among strangers to find bread for the two. She came to one of the fields of Boaz, a man of wealth and position, and a kinsman of Elimelech, and asked permission to glean among the sheaves. In the glory of the early morning, a band of reapers were cutting the bearded barley with their sickles. Behind them, women bound the grain in sheaves, and behind these workers were a group of gleaners, made up from the aged and the young. Ruth took her place among the gleaners, and bending her back like the rest, gathered the stray ears left by the binders. The overseer watched both laborers and gleaners. All were known to him, even the beautiful stranger from the land of Moab. As the day advanced, Boaz 
entered the field with a salutation to his men. The Lord be with you. They replied, The Lord bless thee. Then, glancing around the field, Boaz saw Ruth among the gleaners, and asked the overseer who she was. The overseer replied that she was the Moabitish woman, who came back with Naomi, and that she had asked permission to gather the barley ears with the rest of the gleaners. Boaz was interested at once, and, struck by Ruth's modesty and beauty, he went to her and said she was not to glean in any other fields but his all the time of harvest. He told her she need not fear no rudeness from the young men, for he had laid his commands upon them not to molest or offend her. He also told her that when she was thirsty she was to drink of what had been prepared for the reapers. Ruth was deeply touched by this slight kindness. Bowing to the ground, she asked why it was that she, a stranger, had found grace in his sight. Boaz replied that he had learned of her loving treatment of Naomi since the death of her husband, and how she had left her father and her mother, and the land where she was born, to live with her mother-in-law, and then he invoked the blessing of God upon her and upon her work. The sympathy and sincerity of Boaz were very grateful to Ruth. She was comforted as well, for she knew that he had recognized her goodness to Naomi, and knew that she had come to trust in the care of God. At mealtime Boaz invited her to eat with the reapers, and even handed food to her himself. After the simple meal was eaten, and Ruth was again among the gleaners, Boaz told the reapers to let her glean wherever she chose, and to drop some of the grain on purpose for her, so that her work might be lightened. As the sun began to set, all went their homeward way, and when Ruth reached her home, she beat out all the ears of barley she had gleaned, and found there were three pecks of barley, about ten times as much as a single Israelite's daily portion of manna, while wandering in the wilderness. Her first day's work had secured provision for several days to come. When Naomi saw what a quantity of barley Ruth had brought home, she asked in whose field she had gleaned. Then Ruth related all the events of the day, and how Boaz had been kind to her. It pleased Naomi to hear that Boaz had shown kindness to Ruth and to her, because he was a relation of her husband, and one whose duty it was to care for a widow, and one who had a right to help them by law. Such a relative was called a goal, meaning a redeemer. So the days of the harvest passed. Every day Ruth gleaned in the fields, and at night returned to Naomi. Each day she kept close by the maidens of Boaz, through the barley harvest, and then to the last ingathering of the wheat. The harvest finished, the threshing of the grain began. Naomi was anxious that the Redeemer should exercise his right. According to Israelitish law, when a man died and left his wife childless, his nearest of kin was to take the widow to be his wife, and any son born of this marriage should inherit the name and possessions of the first husband. In this way he kept his brother's name and inheritance from being blotted out. Naomi saw with thankfulness that divine love had led Ruth to the protection of her rightful guardian. So Naomi planned how Ruth should have an opportunity of speaking to Boaz. She told her to take off the sign of her mourning and widowhood, and go to the threshing floor when the grain was beaten out. These threshing floors were either natural spaces of rock or open places covered with large flat stones so that the grain could be readily separated from the husk without waste, and the chaff easily blown away. The sheaves of grain were spread on these places, and a wooden sledge, covered with iron teeth, was dragged over them by oxen until all the grain had fallen from the dry ears. It was a joyful time. The oxen were not muzzled, so they could eat while they worked, and the master and his servants feasted. When the grain was threshed, it was cleaned by the cool winds of morning or evening, and by the aid of large fans. As this winnowing had to be done when the breezes sprang up, 
Master and servant often slept all night at the threshing floors, so as to be ready for the first breath of wind, and to see that the grain was not stolen. Naomi told Ruth to go to the threshing floor of Boaz, and speak to him during the night. Ruth did as she was told, and at the proper time told Boaz that he had the right to redeem her. Boaz was pleased, and told her that he would do as she had said. But he reminded her that while he was her kinsman, there was another who was nearer. He would see this man in the morning, and if he would not exercise his right as redeemer, he would perform the part of a kinsman himself. He told her to lie quietly down until morning, and when it was nearly sunrise, he poured into the veil or cloak that she wore six measures of barley, and sent her home to Naomi. Ruth went on her way in the dusk of dawn, bearing the present of grain on her head, as was the custom of the country. She was returning to her mother-in-law with a story of hope and blessing that had come to her in the promise of Boaz. When she reached home, Naomi's first question was, How hast thou fared, my daughter? Then Ruth told her all that Boaz had said and done, and how he had given her the barley, saying, as he did so, Go not empty to thy mother-in-law. Naomi was pleased, for she understood how Boaz and Ruth felt towards each other, and so said, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fare, for the man will not rest until he have finished the thing this day. In Palestine, nearly every town and many villages were surrounded by walls, and the main entrances there were deep gateways, which generally had broad and shady spaces in front, where people frequently met. These gates became the chief places of interest. They were often arched over and used as watch-towers. They became the guard-house, Business was transacted there, and in this way they became markets. People met in the city gates to discuss the news of the day, and proclamations were made there. Kings and rulers gave audience there, and being a place of general resort, the elders sat there to dispense justice. In the morning, then, Boaz went to the gateway of the city of Bethlehem, ready to fulfill his pledge to Ruth. As he sat there, the man who was the nearest relative of Elimelech passed by. Boaz summoned him to a seat by himself, using the legal form of expression by which he would understand that there was special business to be transacted. Then the elders, or wise and respected citizens, were asked to hear Boaz's case, and to be at once judges and responsible witnesses, and to ratify the proceedings. In their presence, and in the hearing of the people, gathered near, Boaz stated the facts, saying to the Redeemer, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, seeketh the parcel of land which was our brother Elimelech's, and I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants, and before the elders of my people. And then Boaz went on, and asked the man if he would redeem it, and the man said that he would do so. He further explained to him the customs and conditions of the law, and told him if he took the land he must also take Ruth, the Moabitess, to be his wife. But this was a part of the bargain that the man did not want to perform, so he turned his right of redemption over to Boaz, giving as his reason that he would not mind buying the field if it would become his own personal property, but if he should marry Ruth, the field he bought would not belong to him and so he would have paid out money for something which would bring him little or no benefit. It is not at all unlikely that he refused to marry Ruth because she was a Moabitess, fearing that a marriage with an alien might mar his reputation and position in the city. When the man had announced his decision, it was confirmed by the usual custom in all cases of redeeming and exchanging. The one giving up the claim took off his sandal and gave it to the one who received the claim. The matter was thus ratified, as though a bond had been drawn up and signed. In this way, the unnamed kinsman of Elimelach refused to redeem Ruth and her land, and as a proof of it he drew off his sandal and handed it to Boaz, 
before the ten elders and all the people thus transferring it to him the legal right to be the redeemer boaz then called all present to witness that he had that day bought all that was elimelech's and all that was chilion's and all that was malon's and also that ruth the moabitess was to be his wife and all the elders and all the people who were in the gate said they would be witnesses and because boaz had acted so honorably all present united in asking the blessing of god upon his marriage so with the approval and best wishes of his neighbors and friends and above all with the blessing of god boaz and ruth were married the story of ruth is a beautiful one for it shows how the sacrifice and service of love was rewarded naomi in her old age and declining days was made glad and the alien found a happy home in time a son was born to boaz and ruth and the name of obed or the serving one was given to it this boy grew up to be the father of jesse whose son was the mightiest of israel's kings when ruth's baby boy was born the matrons of bethlehem congratulated naomi who became the child's nurse the boy grew up to be the joy of his parents and the comfort of his adopted grandmother and in time the ancestor of mary the mother of jesus the savior of the world then sprang from the tribe of judah and from the gentiles as they were called in the new testament through ruth the moabitess the memory of the faithful loving ruth has been a sweet and living picture for many years she left her home her friends her all to be kind and good to her broken-hearted mother-in-law and to serve god and found much more than she gave up she brought consolation to naomi there came to her love prosperity and peace and through her children's children jesus the christ end of a farmer's wife the story of ruth by j h willard nonsense stories from the book of stories botany alphabets by edward lear this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Four Little Children Who Went Round the World Once upon a time, a long while ago, there were four little people whose names were Violet, Slingsby, Guy, and Lionel. And they all thought they should like to see the world, so they bought a large boat to sail quite round the world by sea, and then they were to come back on the other side by land. The boat was painted blue with green spots, and the sail was yellow with red stripes, and, when they set off, they could only took a small cat to steer and look after the boat, besides an aged elderly quangle-wangle, who had to cook the dinner and make the tea, for which purposes they took a large kettle. For the first ten days they sailed on beautifully, and found plenty to eat, as there were lots of fish and they had only to take them out of the sea with a long spoon, when the quangle-wangle instantly cooked them, and the pussy-cat was fed with the bones, with which she expressed herself pleased on the whole, so that all the party were very happy. During the daytime Violet chiefly occupied herself in putting salt water into the churn, while her three brothers churned it violently, in the hope that it would turn into butter, which it seldom if ever did, and in the evening they all retired into the tea-kettle, where they all managed to sleep very comfortably, while Pussy and the Quangle-Wangle managed the boat. After a time they saw some land at a distance, and when they came to it they found it was an island made of water quite surrounded by earth. Beside that it was bordered by evanescent isthmus, with a great gulf stream running all over it, so that it was perfectly beautiful and contained only a single tree, five hundred and three feet high. When they had landed, they walked about, but found to their great surprise that the island was quite full of veal cutlets and chocolate drops and nothing else. So they all climbed up to the single high tree to discover, if possible, if there were any people. But having remained on the top of the tree for a week, and not seeing anybody, 
they naturally concluded that there were no inhabitants, and accordingly when they came down, they loaded the boat with two thousand veal cutlets and a million of chocolate drops, and these afforded them sustenance for more than a month, during which time they pursued their voyage with utmost delight and apathy. After this they came to a shore where there were no less than sixty-five great red parrots with blue tails, sitting on a rail all of a row, and all fast asleep. And I am sorry to say that the pussycat and the quangle-wangle crept softly, and bit off the tail-feathers of all the sixty-five parrots, for which Violet reproved them both severely. Notwithstanding which, she proceeded to insert all the feathers, two hundred and sixty in number, in her bonnet, thereby causing it to have a lovely and glittering appearance, highly prepossessing and efficacious. The next thing that happened to them was in a narrow part of the sea, which was so entirely full of fishes that the boat could go no farther. So they remained there about six weeks, till they had eaten nearly all the fishes, which were soles, and already cooked and covered with shrimp sauce, so there was no trouble whatever. And as the few fishes who remained uneaten complained of the cold, as well of the difficulty they had in getting any sleep on account of the extreme noise made by the arctic bears and the tropical turnspits, which frequented the neighbourhood in great numbers, Violet most amiably knitted a small woollen frock for several of the fishes, and Slingsby administered some opium drops to them, through which kindness they became quite warm and slept soundly. Then they came to a country which was wholly covered with immense orange trees of a vast size and quite full of fruit, so they all landed, taking with them the tea-kettle, intending to gather some of the oranges, and place them in it. But, while they were busy about this, a most dreadfully high wind rose, and blew out most of the parrot tail-feathers from Violet's bonnet. That, however, was nothing compared with the calamity of the oranges falling down on their heads by millions and millions, which thumped and bumped and bumped and thumped them all so seriously that they were obliged to run as hard as they could for their lives. Besides that, the sound of the oranges rattling on the tea-kettle was of the most fearful and amazing nature. Nevertheless, they got safely to the boat, although considerably vexed and hurt, and the quangle-wangle's right foot was so knocked about that he had to sit with his head in his slipper for at least a week. This event made them all for a time rather melancholy, and perhaps they might never have become less so, had not Lionel, with a most praiseworthy devotion and perseverance, continued to stand on one leg, and whistle to them in a loud and lively manner, which diverted the whole party so extremely that they gradually recovered their spirits, and agreed that whenever they should reach home, they would subscribe towards a testimonial to Lionel, entirely made of gingerbread and raspberries, as an earnest token of their sincere and grateful affection. After sailing on calmly for several more days, they came to another country, where they were much pleased and surprised to see a countless multitude of white mice with red eyes, all sitting in a great circle, slowly eating custard pudding, with a most satisfactory and polite demeanour. And as the four travellers were rather hungry, being tired of eating nothing but soles and oranges for so long a period, they held a council as to the propriety of, of asking the mice for some of their pudding in a humble and affecting manner, by which they could hardly be otherwise than gratified. It was agreed, therefore, that Guy should go and ask the mice, which he immediately did, and the result was that they gave a walnut shell, only half full of custard diluted with water. Now this displeased Guy, who said, "'Out of such a lot of pudding as you have got, I must say, you must have spared a somewhat larger quantity.' But no sooner that he had finished speaking than the mice turned round at once, and sneezed at him in an appalling and vindictive manner, and it is impossible to imagine a more scrubious, unpleasant sound than that caused by the simultaneous sneezing of many millions of angry mice. So that Guy rushed back to the boat, having first shied his cap in the middle of the custard pudding, by which means he completely spoiled the mice's dinner. By and by the four children came to a country where there were no houses, but only an incredibly innumerable number of large bottles without corks, and of a dazzling and sweet susceptible blue colour. Each of these blue bottles contained a blue bottle fly, and all these interesting animals live continually in the most copious and rural harmony, nor perhaps in many parts of the world is such perfect and abject happiness to be found. Violet and Slingsby and Guy and Lionel were greatly struck with this singular and instructive settlement, 
and, having previously asked permission of the blue-bottle flies, which was most courteously granted, the boat was drawn up to the shore, and they proceeded to make tea in front of the bottles. But as they had no tea-leaves, they merely placed some pebbles in the hot water, and the quangle-wangle played some tunes over it on an accordion, by which, of course, tea was made directly, and of the very best quality. The four children then entered into conversation with the blue-bottle flies, who discoursed in a placid and genteel manner, though with a slightly buzzing accent, chiefly owing to the fact that they each held a small clothes-brush between their teeth, which naturally occasioned a fizzy, extraneous utterance. "'Why,' said Violet, "'would you kindly inform us do you reside in bottles? And, if in bottles at all, why not rather in green or purple, or indeed in yellow bottles?' To which questions a very aged blue bottle fly answered, "We found the bottles here all ready to live in. That is to say, our great 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 grandfathers did. So we occupied them at once. And when the winter comes on, we turn the bottles upside down, and consequently rarely feel the cold at all. And you know very well that this could not be the case with bottles of any other colour than blue. Of course it could not," said Slingsby. "'But if we may take the liberty of inquiring, on what do you chiefly subsist?' "'Mainly on oyster patties,' said the blue-bottle fly, "'and when these are scarce, on raspberry vinegar and Russian leather, boiled down to a jelly.' "'How delicious!' said Guy, to which Lionel added, "'Huzz!' and all the blue-bottle flies said, "'Buzz!' "'At this time an elderly fly said it was the hour for the evening song to be sung, "'and, on a signal being given, all the blue bottle flies began to buzz at once in a sumptuous and sonorous manner, the melodious and mochilaginous sounds echoing all over the waters, and resounding across the tumultuous tops of the transitory titmice, upon the intervening and verdant mountains with a serene and sickly suavity only known to the truly virtuous. The moon was shining slobaciously from the stars bespangled sky while her light irrigated the smooth and shiny sides and wings and backs of the blue-bottle flies with a peculiar and trivial splendour, while all nature cheerfully responded to the cerulean and conspicuous circumstances. In many long after years the four little travellers looked back to that evening as one of the happiest in all their lives, and it was already past midnight, when, the sail of the boat having been set up by the quangle-wangle, the tea-kettle and churn placed in their respective positions, and the pussycat stationed at the helm, the children each took a last and affectionate farewell of the blue-bottle flies, who walked down in a body to the water's edge to see the travellers embark. As a token of parting respect and esteem, Violet made a curtsy quite down to the ground, and stuck one of her few remaining parrot-tail feathers into the back hair of the most pleasing of the blue-bottle flies, while Slingsby, Guy, and Lionel offered them three small boxes containing, respectively, black pins, dried figs, and Epsom salts, and thus they left that happy shore for ever. Overcome by their feelings, the four little travellers instantly jumped into the tea-kettle and fell fast asleep. But all along the shore for many hours there was a distinctively heard a sound of severely suppressed sobs, and a vague multitude of living creatures using their pocket-handkerchiefs in a subdued simultaneous snuffle, lingering sadly along the walloping waves as the boat sailed further and further away from the land of happy blue-bottle flies. Nothing particular occurred for some days after these events, except that, as the travellers were passing a low tract of sand, they perceived an unusual and gratifying spectacle, namely a large number of crabs and crawfish, perhaps six or seven hundred sitting by the waterside, and endeavouring to disentangle a vast heap of pale pink worsted, which they moistened at intervals with a fluid composed of lavender water and white wine negus. "'Can we be of any service to you, O crusty crabbies?' said the four children. "'Thank you kindly,' said the crabs consecutively. "'We are trying to make some worsted mittens, but we do not know how.' On which Violet, who was perfectly acquainted with the art of mitten-making, said to the crabs, "'Do your claws unscrew, or are they fixtures?' "'They are all made to unscrew,' said the crabs, and forthwith they deposited a great pile of claws close to the boat, with which Violet uncombed all the pale pink worsted, and then made the loveliest mittens with it you can imagine. These, the crabs, having resumed and screwed on their claws, placed cheerfully upon their wrists, and walked away rapidly on their hind legs, warbling songs with a silvery voice and in a minor key. 
After this the four little people sailed on again, till they came to a vast and wide plain of astonishing dimensions, on which nothing whatever could be discovered at first. But, as the travellers walked onward, there appeared in the extreme and dim distance a single object, which on a nearer approach, and on an accurately cutaneous inspection, seemed to be somebody in a large white wig, sitting on an armchair made of sponge-cakes and oyster-shells. "'It does not quite look like a human being,' said Violet doubtfully. Nor could they make out what it really was, till the quangle-wangle, who had previously been round the world, exclaimed softly in a loud voice, "'It is the cooperative cauliflower!' And so in truth it was, and they soon found that what they had taken for an immense wig was in reality the top of the cauliflower, and that he had no feet at all, being able to walk tolerably well with a fluctuating and graceful movement on a single cabbage stalk, an accomplishment which naturally saved him from the expense of stockings and shoes. Presently, while the whole party from the boat was gazing at him with mingled affection and disgust, he suddenly arose, and in a somewhat plumdumphious manner, hurried off towards the setting sun, his steps supported by two superincumbent confidential cucumbers, and a large number of water wagtails proceeding in advance of him by three and three in a row, till he finally disappeared on the brink of the western sky in a crystal cloud of pseudorific sand. So remarkable a sight, of course, impressed the four children very deeply, and they returned immediately to their boat with a strong sense of underdeveloped asthma and a great appetite. Shortly after this, the travellers were obliged to sail directly below some high overhanging rocks, from the top of one of which a peculiarly odious little boy, dressed in rose-coloured knickerbockers and with a pewter plate upon his head, threw an enormous pumpkin at the boat, by which it was instantly upset. But this upsetting was of no consequence, because all the party knew how to swim very well, and in fact they preferred swimming about till after the moon rose, when, the water growing chilly, they spongetaciously entered the boat. Meanwhile the quangle-wangle threw back the pumpkin with immense force, so that it hit the rocks where the malicious little boy in rose-coloured knickerbockers was sitting, when, being quite full of lucifer matches, the pumpkin exploded surreptitiously into a thousand bits, whereon the rock instantly took fire, and the odious little boy became unpleasantly hotter and hotter and hotter, till his knickerbockers were turned quite green and his nose was burnt off. Two or three days after this happened, they came to another place, where they found nothing at all except some wide and deep pits full of mulberry jam. This is the property of the tiny yellow-nosed apes, who abound in these districts, and who store up the mulberry jam for their food in winter, when they mix it with pellucid pale periwinkle soup and serve it in wedgewood china bowls, which grow freely all over that part of the country. Only one of the yellow-nosed apes was on the spot, and he was fast asleep, yet the four travellers and the quangle-wangle and pussy were so terrified by the violence and sanguinary sound of his snoring that they merely took a small cupful of the jam and returned to re-embark in the boat without delay. What was their horror on seeing the boat, including the churn and the tea-kettle, in the mouth of the enormous sea spider, an aquatic and ferocious creature truly dreadful to behold, and happily only met with in those excessive longitudes? In a moment the beautiful boat was bitten into fifty-five thousand million hundred billion bits, and it instantly became quite clear that Violet Slingsby, Guy and Lionel could no longer preliminate their voyage by sea. The four travellers were therefore obliged to resolve on pursuing their wanderings by land, and, very fortunately, there happened to pass by at that moment an elderly rhinoceros, on which they seized, and, all four mounting on his back, the quangle-wangle sitting on his horn and holding on by his ears, and the pussycat swinging at the end of his tail, they set off, having only four small beans and three pounds of mashed potatoes to last through the whole journey. They were, however, able to catch a number of the chickens and turkeys and other birds, who incessantly alighted on the head of the rhinoceros for the purpose of gathering the seeds of the rhododendron plants which grew there and these creatures they cooked in the most translucent and satisfactory manner, by means of a fire lighted on the end of the rhinoceros's back. A crowd of kangaroos and gigantic cranes accompanied them, from feelings of curiosity and complacency, so they were never at a loss for company, and went onward, as it were, in a sort of profuse and triumphant procession. 
Thus, in less than eighteen weeks, they all arrived safely at home, where they were received by their admiring relatives with joy tempered with contempt, and where they finally resolved to carry out the rest of their travelling plans at some more favourable opportunity. As for the rhinoceros, in token of their grateful adherence, they had him killed and stuffed directly, and then set him up outside the door of their father's house as a diaphanous door-scraper. End of the story of the four little children who went round the world. Valentine's by Ellen D. Masters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Valentine's The wind was blowing down our street, and it was snowing some. But I watched from the chilly porch to see the postman come. Across the street to Elsie's door, and then I meant to run. Before she got the valentine, I knew that she'd get one. I knew it would be beautiful, with lace and hearts and things, and pretty verses on the leaves, and tied with ribbon strings. I knew the verses by heart. I knew the bows were pink. The hearts were gold, the lace was white. Oh, what would Elsie think? I saw the postman come at last, and Elsie at the door. She got a valentine, sure enough. I knew she would before. And then I hid inside our hall, and when his whistle blew, the postman called, Hello, hello, a valentine for you. Sure enough, I got a valentine, with lace and hearts and things, and pretty verses on the leaves, and tied with ribbon strings. And I have wondered ever since, and guessed if Elsie knew, for sure I'd get a valentine before the postman blew. Just like I knew that she'd get one, and knew her verses too, I never supposed that I'd get one. Do you guess Elsie knew? End of Valentine's Recorded February 14th, 2010 By Matthew Pettis The History of the Seven Families of the Lake Pipple Popple by Edward Lear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Seven Families of the Lake Pipple Popple by Edward Lear. Read by Algy Pug. Chapter 1 Introductory. In former days, that is to say, once upon a time, there lived in the land of Gramble Bramble seven families. They lived by the side of the great Lake Pipple Popple. One of the seven families, indeed, lived in the lake, and on the outskirts of the city of Tosh, which, excepting when it was quite dark, they could see plainly. The names of all these places you have probably heard of, and you have only not to look in your geography books to find out all about them. Now the seven families who lived on the borders of the great Lake Pipple Popple were as follows in the next chapter. Chapter 2. The Seven Families There was a family of two old parrots and seven young parrots. There was a family of two old storks and seven young storks. There was a family of two old geese and seven young geese. There was a family of two old owls and seven young owls. There was a family of two old guinea pigs, and seven young guinea pigs. There was a family of two old cats, and seven young cats. And there was a family of two old fishes, and seven young fishes. Chapter 3. The Habits of the Seven Families The parrots lived upon the softy pofsky tree which were beautiful to behold, and covered with blue leaves, and they fed upon fruit, artichokes, and striped beetles. The storks walked in and out of Lake Pipple Popple, and ate frogs for breakfast, and buttered toast for tea, but on account of the extreme length of their legs, they could not sit down, and so they walked about continually. The geese, having webs to their feet, caught quantities of flies, which they ate for dinner. The owls anxiously looked after mice, which they caught and made into sago puddings. The guinea pigs toddled about the gardens, and ate lettuces and Cheshire cheese. 
The cats sat still in the sunshine, and fed upon sponge biscuits. The fishes lived in the lake, and fed chiefly on boiled periwinkles. And all these seven families lived together in the utmost fun and felicity. Chapter 4 The children of the seven families are sent away. One day all the seven fathers and the seven mothers of the seven families agreed that they would send their children out to see the world. So they called them all together, and gave them each eight shillings, and some good advice, some chocolate drops, and a small green Morocco pocket book to set down their expenses in. They then particularly entreated them not to quarrel, and all the parents sent off their children with a parting injunction. If said the old parents. You find a cherry. Do not fight about who should have it. And, said the old storks, if you find a frog, divide it carefully into seven bits, but on no account quarrel about it. And the old geese said to the seven young geese, Whatever you do, be sure that you do not touch a plum pudding flea. And the old owls said, if you find a mouse, tear him into seven slices, and eat him cheerfully, but without quarrelling. And the old guinea pig said, Have a care that you eat your lettuces, should you find any, not greedily, but calmly. And the old cat said, Be particularly careful not to meddle with a clangle-wangle, if you should see one. And the old fisher said, Above all things, avoid eating a blue boss wass, for they do not agree with fishes and give them a pain in their toes. So that all the children of each family thanked their parents, and making in all forty-nine polite bows, they went into the wide world. Chapter 5 The History of the Seven Young Parrots The seven young parrots had not gone far, when they saw a tree with a single cherry on it, which the oldest parrot picked instantly. But the other six, being extremely hungry, tried to get it also, on which all the seven began to fight, and they scuffled, and huffled, and ruffled, and shuffled, and puffled, and muffled, and buffled, and duffled, and fluffled, and guffled, and bruffled, and screamed, and shrieked, and squealed, and squeaked, and clawed, and snapped, and bit, and bumped, and thumped, and dumped, and flumped each other, till they were all torn into little bits, and at last there was nothing left to record this painful incident except the cherry and seven small green feathers. And that was the vicious and voluble end of the seven young parrots. Chapter 6 The History of the Seven Young Storks When the seven young storks set out, they walked, or flew, for fourteen weeks in a straight line, and for six weeks more in a crooked one, and after that they ran as hard as they could for a hundred and eight miles, and after that they stood still, and made a himultaneous chatter-clatter-blattery noise with their bills. About the same time they perceived a large frog, spotted with green, and with a sky-blue stripe under each ear. So, being hungry, they immediately flew at him, and were going to divide him into seven pieces, when they began to quarrel as to which of his legs should be taken off first. One said this, and another said that, and while they were all quarrelling, the frog hopped away, and when they saw he was gone, they began to chatter, clatter, blatter, platter, patter, blatter, matter, clatter, flatter, quatter, more violently than ever, and after they had fought for a week, they picked each other all to little pieces, so that at last nothing was left of any of them except their bills. And that was the end of the seven young storks. Chapter 7 The History of the Seven Young Geese When the seven young geese began to travel, they went over a large plain, on which there was but one tree, and that was a very bad one. So four of them went up to the top of it, and looked about them, while the other three waddled up and down and repeated poetry, and their last six lessons in arithmetic, geography, and cookery. Presently they perceived, a long way off, 
an object of the most interesting and obese appearance, having a perfectly round body exactly resembling a boiled plum pudding, with two little wings and a beak, and three feathers growing out of his head, and only one leg. So, after a time, all the seven young geese said to each other, Beyond all doubt, this beast must be a plum pudding flea, on which they incautiously began to sing aloud, Plum pudding flea, plum pudding flea, wherever you be, oh, come to our tree, oh, listen, oh, listen, oh, listen to me. And no sooner had they sung this verse than the plum pudding flea began to hop and skip on his one leg with the most dreadful velocity, and came straight to the tree, where he stopped and looked about him in a vacant and voluminous manner, on which the seven young geese were greatly alarmed, and all of a tremble bemble. So one of them put out his long neck, and just touched him with the top of his bill. But no sooner had he done this, than the plum pudding flea skipped and hopped about more and more, and higher and higher, after which he opened his mouth, and, to the great surprise and indignation of the seven geese, began to bark so loudly and furiously and terribly, that they were totally unable to bear the noise, and by degrees every one of them suddenly tumbled down quite dead. So that was the end of the seven young geese. Chapter 8. The History of the Seven Young Owls When the seven young owls set out, they sat every now and then on the branches of old trees, and never went far at one time. And one night, when it was quite dark, they thought they heard a mouse. But as the gas lamps were not lighted, they could not see him. So they called out, Is that a mouse? On which a mouse answered, Squeaky, peaky, weaky, yes, it is. And immediately all the young owls threw themselves off the tree, meaning to alight on the ground. But they did not perceive that there was a large well below them, into which they all fell superficially, and were every one of them drowned in less than half a minute. So that was the end of the seven young owls. Chapter 9 The History of the Seven Young Guinea Pigs the seven young guinea pigs went into a garden full of gooseberry bushes and tiggery trees, under one of which they fell asleep. When they awoke, they saw a large lettuce which had grown out of the ground while they had been sleeping, and which had an immense number of green leaves, at which they all exclaimed, Lettuce! O oh, lettuce! Let us! O oh, let us! O oh, lettuce leaves! O oh, let us leave this tree and eat lettuce! O oh, lettuce! Lettuce leaves! And instantly the seven young guinea pigs rushed with such extreme force against the lettuce plant, and hit their heads so vividly against its stalk, that the concussion brought on directly an incipient transitional inflammation of their noses, which grew worse and worse and worse and worse, till it incidentally killed them all seven. And that was the end of the seven young guinea pigs. Chapter 10. The History of the Seven Young Cats. The seven young cats set off on their travels with great delight and rapacity, but on coming to the top of a high hill they perceived that a long distance off a clangle wangle, or, as it is more properly written, clangle wangle, and in spite of the warning they had had, they ran straight up to it. Now the clangle wangle is a most dangerous and delusive beast, and by no means commonly to be met with. They live in the water as well as on land using their long tail as a sail when in the former element. Their speed is extreme, but their habits of life are domestic and superfluous, and their general demeanour pensive and pellucid. On summer evenings they may sometimes be observed near the lake Pipple-Popple, standing on their heads and humming their national melodies. They subsist entirely on vegetables, excepting when they eat veal or mutton or pork or beef or fish or saltpetre. The moment the Clangle Wangle saw the seven young cats approach, he ran away, and as he ran straight on for four months, and the cats, though they continued to run, could never overtake him, they all gradually died of fatigue and exhaustion, and never afterwards recovered. And that was the end of the seven young cats. Chapter 11. The History of the Seven Young Fishes The seven young fishes swam across the lake Pipple-Popple, and into the river, and into the ocean, where, most unhappily for them, 
they saw, on the fifteenth day of their travels, a bright blue boswas, and instantly swam after him. But the blue boswas plunged into a perpendicular, spicular, orbicular, quadrangular, circular depth of soft mud, where, in fact, his house was. And the seven young fishes, swimming with great and uncomfortable velocity, plunged also into the mud quite against their will, and not being accustomed to it, were all suffocated in a very short period. And that was the end of the seven young fishes. Chapter 12 Of What Occurred Subsequently After it was known that the seven young parrots, and the seven young storks, and the seven young geese, and the seven young owls, and the seven young guinea pigs, and the seven young cats, and the seven young fishes were all dead, then the frog, and the plum-pudding flea, and the mouse, and the clangle-wangle, and the blue boss-wass, all met together to rejoice over their good fortune. And they collected the seven feathers of the seven young parrots, and the seven bills of the seven young storks, and the lettuce and the cherry. And having placed the latter on the lettuce, and the other objects in a circular arrangement at their base, they danced a hornpipe round all these memorials until they were quite tired after which they gave a tea-party, and a garden-party, and a ball, and a concert, and then returned to their respective homes full of joy and respect, sympathy, satisfaction, and disgust. CHAPTER Thirteen, OF WHAT BECAME OF THE PARENTS OF THE FORTY-NINE CHILDREN But when the two old parrots, and the two old storks, and the two old geese, and the two old owls, and the two old guinea-pigs, and the two old cats, and the two old fishes, became aware, by reading the newspapers, of the calamitous extinction of the whole of their families, they refused all further sustenance, and sending out to various shops, they purchased great quantities of cayenne pepper and brandy and vinegar and blue sealing-wax, besides seven immense glass bottles with air-tight stoppers, and, having done this, they ate a light supper of brown bread and Jerusalem artichokes, and took an affecting and formal leave of the whole of their acquaintance, which was very numerous and distinguished and select and responsible and ridiculous. Chapter 14. Conclusion After this, they filled the bottles with the ingredients for pickling, and each couple jumped into a separate bottle, by which effort, of course, they all died immediately and became thoroughly pickled in a few minutes, having previously made their wills by the assistance of the most eminent lawyers of the district, in which they left strict orders that the stoppers of the seven bottles should be carefully sealed up with the blue sealing wax they had purchased, and that they themselves, in the bottles, should be presented to the principal museum of the city of Tosh, to be labelled with parchment, or any other anti-congenial succedaneum, and to be placed on a marble table with silver gilt legs, for the daily inspection and contemplation, and for the perpetual benefit of the pusillanimous public. And if you ever go to Gramble Bramble, and visit that museum in the city of Tosh, look for them on the 98th table in the 427th room of the right-hand corridor of the left wing of the central quadrangle of that magnificent building. For, if you do not, you certainly will not see them. End of the History of the Seven Families of the Lake Pipplepopple This recording is in the public domain. Limericks from A Book of Nonsense by Edward Lear This is a Liverbox recording. All Liverbox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit org. Recording by Elijah. Limericks from A Book of Nonsense by Edward Lear. There was an old man in a pew whose waistcoat was spotted with blue, but he tore it in pieces to give to his nieces. A cheerful old man in a pew. There was a young lady of her, who was chased by a virulent bull, but she seized on a spade and called out, Who's afraid? which distracted that virulent bull. 
There was an old person of Dutton, whose head was as small as a button. So to make it look big, he purchased a wig, and rapidly rushed about Dutton. There was an old man who said, "Hush! I perceive a young bird in this bush." When they said, "Is it small?" he replied, "Not at all. It is four times as big as a bush." There was an old man who said, "How shall I free from this horrible cow? I will sit on this stile and continue to smile, which may soften the heart of that cow." There was a young lady of Troy. Whom several large flies did annoy. Some she killed with a sump, some she drowned at the pump, and some she took with her to Troy. End of limericks from a book of nonsense by Edward Lear, recording by Elijah. Dumbling and the Three Feathers by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter M. Dumbling and the Three Feathers by the Brothers Grimm. Dumbling and the Three Feathers. Once upon a time, there lived a king who had three sons. The two elder were learned and bright. But the youngest said very little and appeared somewhat foolish, so he was always known as Dumbling. When the king grew old and feeble, feeling that he was nearing his end, he wished to leave the crown to one of his three sons, but could not decide to which. He therefore settled that they should travel, and that the one who could obtain the most splendid carpet should ascend the throne when he died. So that there could be no disagreement as to the way each one should go, the king conducted them to the courtyard of the palace, and there blew three feathers by turn into the air, telling his sons to follow the course that the three feathers took. Then one of the feathers flew eastwards, another westwards, but the third went straight up towards the sky, though it only sped a short distance before falling to earth. Therefore, one son travelled towards the east, and the second went to the west. Both making fun of poor Dumbling, who was obliged to stay where his feather had fallen. Then Dumbling, sitting down and feeling rather miserable after his brothers had gone, looked about him and noticed that near to where his feather lay was a trap door. On lifting this up, he perceived a flight of steps down which he went. At the bottom was another door, so he knocked upon it and then heard a voice calling, "Maiden fairest, come to me. Make haste to open the door." A mortal surely you will see, from the world above is he, we'll help him from our store. And then the door was flung open, and the young man found himself facing a big toad sitting in the center of a number of young toads. The big toad addressed him, asking him what he wanted. Dumbling, though rather surprised when he saw the toads and heard them question him, being good-hearted, replied politely, I'm desirous to obtain the most splendid carpet in the world. Just now it would be extremely useful to me. The toad who had just spoken called to a young toad, saying, "Maiden fairest, come to me. 'Tis a mortal here you see. Let us speed all his desires, giving him what he requires." Immediately the young toad fetched a large box. This the old one opened and took out an exquisite carpet of so beautiful a design that it certainly could have been manufactured nowhere upon the earth. Taking it with grateful thanks, Dumbling went up the flight of steps and was once more in the palace courtyard. The two elder brothers, being of the opinion that the youngest was so foolish that he was of no account whatever in trying to obtain the throne, for they did not think he would find anything at all, had said to each other, "It is not necessary for us to trouble much in looking for the carpet." So they took from the shoulders of the first peasant they came across a coarse shawl, and this they carried to their father. At the same time, Dumbling appeared with his beautiful carpet, which he presented to the king, who was very much surprised and said, "By rights, the throne should be for my youngest son." But when the two brothers heard this, they gave the old king no rest, saying, "How is it possible that Dumbling, who is not at all wise, could control the affairs of an important kingdom? Make some other condition, we beg of you." Well, agreed the father, "the one who brings me the most magnificent ring." Shall succeed to my throne, and once more he took his sons outside the palace. 
Then, again, he blew three feathers into the air to show the direction each one should go, whereupon the two elder sons went east and west, but Dumlings flew straight up and fell close by the trap-door. Then the youngest son descended the steps as before, and upon seeing the large toad he talked with her and told her what he desired. So the big box was brought, and out of it the toad handed him a ring, which was of so exquisite a workmanship that no goldsmiths could equal it. Meanwhile, the two elder brothers made fun of the idea of Dumbling searching for a ring, and they decided to take no needless trouble themselves. Therefore, finding an old iron ring belonging to some harness, they took that to the king. Dumbling was there before them with his valuable ring, and immediately upon showing it, the father declared that in justice the kingdom should be his. In spite of this, however, the two elder sons worried the poor king into appointing one test further, before bestowing his kingdom, and the king, giving away, announced that the one who brought home the most beautiful woman should inherit the crown. Then Dumbling again descended to the large toad and made known to her that he wished to find the most beautiful woman alive. The most beautiful woman is not always at hand, said the toad. However, you shall have her. Then she gave to him a scooped-out turnip, to which half a dozen little mice were attached. The young man regarded this a trifle despondently, for it had no great resemblance to what he was seeking. What can I make of this? he asked. Only place in it one of my young toads, replied the large toad, and then you can decide how to use it. From the young toads around the old toad, the young man seized one at hazard, and placed it in the scooped-out turnip, but hardly was it there when the most astounding change occurred, for the toad was transformed into a wondrously lovely maiden. The turnip became an elegant carriage, and the six mice were turned into handsome horses. The young man kissed the maiden, and drove off to bring her to the king. Not long afterwards, the two brothers arrived. In the same way, as the twice before, they had taken no trouble about the matter, but had picked up the first passable-looking peasant women, whom they had happened to meet. After glancing at the three, the king said, Without doubt, at my death, the kingdom will be dumblings. Once more, the brothers loudly expressed their discontent, and gave the king no peace, declaring, It is impossible for us to agree to dumbling becoming the ruler of the kingdom and they insisted that the women should be required to spring through a hoop which was suspended from the ceiling in the centre of the hall, thinking to themselves, Now certainly our peasants will get the best of it. They are active and sturdy, but that fragile lady will kill herself if she jumps. To this, again, the king consented, and the peasants were first given trial. They sprang through the hoop indeed, but so clumsily that they fell breaking their arms and legs upon which the lovely lady whom Dumbling had brought home leapt through as lightly as a fawn, and this put an end to all contention. So the crown came to Dumbling, who lived long and ruled his people temperately and justly. End of Dumbling and the Three Feathers